So, hi, I'm Kelly Jean, and today I'll be talking about how to turbocharge your data science with Python or R. Um, just kidding, I lied to you already. I'm going to be talking about how to turbocharge your data science with Python and R. Um, but first, what the heck is a data scientist? Um, it depends on the company, but here are a few roles that you can have. So, for example, there's data science analysts, and traditionally these are data analysts or business analysts. They focus on ensuring metrics are accessible to the right stakeholders and analyzing the health of the business. They also use data to find areas that could be made more efficient or optimized. And then there's product data scientists. So they partner with product managers and engineers to focus on product initiatives. For example, building models to improve user experience on the product. And then there's experimentation data scientists. So these are data scientists who work on things like A-B testing and other experiments to measure the impact of changes. Uh, and then you, there's growth and marketing data scientists. They focus on things like optimizing Google AdWords spend, SEO analysis, LTV modeling, and other things like that. And this isn't an exhaustive list of the types of data scientists you can encounter in the wild. Um, and these aren't mutually exclusive roles. So many data scientists actually do parts and pieces of, the, of these roles, it really depends on the company. But what all these roles is, have in common is that they leverage data to uh, solve problems and gain insights. And I realize that this is a very broad definition for a data science role, uh, but the role really is that broad. And um, I'm largely a product data scientist, so I'm going to be focusing on working through that workflow of a product data scientist. But before jumping into this um, workflow, what's R? Um, according to the R website, it, R is a language and environment for statistical computing and graphics. Basically, it's a programming language built by statisticians, not computer scientists. So it's built by statisticians um, whose first name started with the letter R. Uh, it has some differences with Python. For example, you'll see indexing starts at one, uh, not zero, but the syntax is largely the same. Uh, so loops have the same general structure. Lists in Python um, are called vectors in R, uh, and they have the similar properties that they do in, in Python. And data frames exist in both R and Python, and they share similar properties that make it a whole lot easier to work with data. Uh, one big difference is that when typical, typical people say Python, they refer to a type of snake, uh, while for R, they're referring to the letter in the, in the alphabet. And R and Python are actually very similar when it comes to doing most data science work. Uh, so there is this great debate, should I use Python or R in data science? And you see it pop up in Reddit, it's like R versus Python, um, Python versus R. I, um, should I learn R or Python? Somewhat experienced programmer, dot, dot, dot. Um, is R better than Python at anything? I started learning R half a year ago and I wonder if I should switch. Um, you also get the opposite. Why do we need Python when R is so brilliant, blah, blah, blah. Um, which is fast and easy language for sentiment analysis on Twitter data, R or Python? So you, you get the idea, that they just keep asking R or Python. Um, and there's also a lot of Twitter stuff, but I got tired of screenshotting. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's like to further emphasize that the two languages are very similar, uh, you also have equivalent packages in Python and R. Um, so as I mentioned, we have data frames for both. Python has pandas and numpy, R has base R, and when I say base R, I'm saying you just need R without any packages, uh, and then you can use dplyr and R to do data manip manipulation. And then for plotting, there's matplotlib, seaborn, Voca in Python, and R has base, ggplot2, high charter. Uh, for statistics, you have stats model in Python, R has base. For common machine learning models, there's scikit-learn, uh, and R, you actually need a lot of different 
random packages to get the equivalent of scikit-learn. So you have caret, glm, xgboost, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for deep learning, they both have TensorFlow. And you also have packages to connect um, the other language, languages. So for example, to go from um, Python to read in R in Python, you have uh, RPy2 and others. And then for R uh, to get Python code in R, you have Reticulate, Snake Charmer, et cetera. So when I'm asked Python or R, uh, as I already mentioned, as a data scientist, I'll have both. Um, so I'll walk you through a modeling pro problem that is a pretty basic data science task that most data scientists have done at one point or another in their career. Uh, and I'll show you where I would use R and where I'd use py Python. Um, so this modeling problem is just uh, given a binary response or a binary variable, um, how can we use other features in a data set to predict that binary variable? Um, so I have a New York City dog data set that I found. It's publicly available. And it has things like the dog's name, the gender, um, things like the coloring, uh, the zip code, and also a feature that's whether or not the dog has been spayed slash neutered. Uh, so I'm going to use this data set uh, to build a model to predict whether a New York City dog has been spayed or neutered. Um, before we jump into this problem, uh, I'm going to discuss what my typical data scientific method looks like. Uh, so first, there's ETLs, so extract, transform, and load. And what this means in general is you have data that is as clean as possible that can be readily explored. Um, so you want to get your data to that state. Uh, and that's what you do when you're doing ETLs. And if you're lucky, you have a data engineer to do that for you instead. Um, um, data engineers are great. They like to do those things. As a data scientist, I don't really like to do those things. Um, so hopefully your company has someone to do that. Uh, next, there's pre-learning. And what I mean by this is EDA, exploratory data analysis, um, any feature engineering. So you might think, OK, maybe if I do some sort of transformations to a feature, it might be more predictive. You can do this during this phase uh, when you're visualizing the data. And then the next step is learning. So modeling your data or training your model. and Data scientists will say this a lot. They're training their, uh, training their model. And what they mean, essentially, is they're sending data through an algorithm or function to optimize another function. Uh, and then there's post-learning. Post so you've trained a model. Now you should definitely evaluate this model uh, and see how it's doing on your data. And you should probably document this and present it. And when you document it, you can present it to other stakeholders in a consumable format. And if all goes well, then it's deployment time. So you can think of creating a microservice or a data science as a service to call the model in production. Uh, so I'm going to focus on these uh, middle th three sections, because uh, that's where I think using R and Python is the most interesting. Like for deployment, it's clear you should use Python. You shouldn't be using R. Uh, and for ETLs, I don't really like to do any ETL work, so I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> and so I'll focus on these middle three. OK, so the plan of action for this dog data set is to use the other variables, aka features, such as the dog name, gender, et cetera, to provide a prediction for the, whether or not we believe a dog is spayed or neutered. And the pre-learning, uh, I'll do in R, and the rest I'll do in Python. OK, so the pre-learning, uh, the EDA part, it can be quickly done in R, and we can easily share this if we use R Markdown. Uh, so by now, you've seen a lot of presentations where you've seen Jupyter Notebooks, and we saw how great it was. So it allows for reproducible analysis. You can organize your code chunks. Uh, it's easy to provide reports to others with Jupyter Notebooks. And R Markdown is very similar. 
Um, but I would say one big pro for R Markdown is that once you get a handle of the weird syntax in R, it provides very clean visuals. So I typically elect not to use Python, and I use R Markdown. So let me show you a R Markdown file of the dog data set. And so you can see I have, so I have code chunks right here. And you can see, like, to define a code chunk, I just start it with three vac ticks, and then I'll end it, the code chunks with three vac ticks to show that that code chunk is done. And what I like about R Markdown is I can run each individual command. Um, so I can load stuff. You'll see there's a green status bar that tells me where that uh, line of code is running at that point. Uh, so I have the dogs data set loaded. I can, in the R console, just look at this data set very quickly. I can do other stuff with this data set. So I can s do a summary of it uh, without affecting the R markdown file. Uh, and like Jupyter Notebooks, I can run the code chunk, then I'll see a, uh, the output of that code chunk. Uh, and I, when I'm running, say, a vague code chunk, I can see how it's progressing, where it's stuck at, um, where it errors out at very easily. And I can do what a thing what we call is to knit this document, which is to essentially generate uh, HTML or PDF. So in Jupyter Notebooks, you can do that similar process. Uh, but with R Markdown, you can see, OK, right now it's running the code chunk geography. So if I see an error out there, I know where to look. Um, and I know what's taking a long time. So right now it's 65% complete. It's still running. Uh, and what I get back, is so I don't know where my presentation went. <laughs> I was on the note. Okay. Uh, so I'll get an HTML document. And what you'll see is like you have a, a nice table of contents. You have a header. Uh, and where this comes from is in the R markdown file, you'll see I start the R markdown with a YAML. Uh, so I'm specifying the title. I'm saying it's going to be an HTML document. I have a table of contents. and I write content with Markdown. That's why it's called R Markdown. Uh, you write in Markdown, and you get the this nice output. Uh, that's very similar to Jupyter Notebooks, but I think it's just for me personally more organized. Uh, so I can see box plots. If I want to include code, like I can in Jupyter Notebooks, I can do that as well. I can include maps different visualizations, et cetera. Um, so you can see things like, OK, for uh, most people have just not put their dog name. Uh, and that can potentially be some feature engineering that you can do. Is the dog name missing? And things like that. OK. OK, so R is great at doing that. But Python is a lot better once you get to the modeling phase, at least for me personally. Um, so Python plus scikit-learn, um, which provides the machine learning packages and the statistical models that you can use to fit data, is great. And then plus pandas and NumPy just makes it working with data and modeling data just a lot cleaner for me and a lot easier than it would be in R. Um, so I can, I've created a Jupyter Notebook where I've essentially imported pandas, imported NumPy, and all these scikit-learn um, helpers and functions so that I've loaded the data. 
Uh, I split the data into training and test set. So this is just a pre-vote uh, function in scikit-learn. And then you can immediately start uh, fitting your model. So here I'm running a logistic regression with an L2 penalty. And that means I'm running a ridge regression. Uh, and I can look at uh, different model metrics, feature importance, other plots. Uh, so here I'm looking at the AUC score, uh, which is a ML model metric that goes between 0 and 1. Um, if it should be higher than 0.5, if you're if it's less than 0.5, you're doing something wrong. Uh, so make sure it's above 0.5. And what's great about Scikit-Learn is I can fit a bunch of different models. So here I'm fitting uh, another logistic regression, but this time with an L1 penalty, uh, and I can essentially run the same function uh, because it has the same structure and features uh, that the ridge regression had and fit another model. And I can see do the same thing with a tree-based model, a GVM, uh, and get the same sort of report without any additional effort. So I can quickly fit different models and see improvements in my uh, scoring of the model very easily and very quickly. Okay. So now I have two files, though. I have a file in R, and I have a file in Python. And it's kind of annoying, because now my workflow is very separated out. Uh, but is there a way where we can connect these two languages, connect these two files that makes it a much more smooth process? And fortunately, there is. So in my Jupyter notebook, I was actually reading the data by calling R. And this was done using RPy2. So I import the package, and I just have these few lines of code, uh, which is activating R, and then I'm using this R function, read RDS, and reading in an R object, an RDS, into Python, and then converting, that last line is converting that um, RDS object into a pandas data frame. And I can also do the reverse. So in R, particularly in with R markdown, with reticulate, I can easily run Python code by just specifying in the uh, code chunk header. Instead of saying R, I just say Python. And then all of a sudden, that code chunk will run Python. Um, so I can run a for loop. And I can even import paper mill and execute Jupyter notebooks. So I'm essentially connecting and automating my uh, Jupyter notebook that I created to fit different models with my R markdown file. And this allows me to ensure that in my R markdown, I can actually report out the Python models that I've built out and evaluated in Python in my R file. So that's my talk. And you can find the slides and the code at my GitHub. Thanks. As I trip my